Welcome to Cider Chat. This is a live recording and also a pre recorded episode or presentation from CiderCon 2023 that was held in Chicago. That was held by the American Cider Association. And you can see on screen here we have Richie Brady. He is live right now from Ireland. And next to him is the slide presentation that he presented at CiderCon 2023. He's going to be talking about a proposal for a systematic approach to tasting cider. I'm going to be going off screen shortly, but while I have you up here on the YouTube channel for Cider Chat, I want to recommend that you do subscribe and follow this channel so you can get more amazing content like this with Richie. So we're going to be going a little bit live here with Richie talking us in through the intro, and then we'll be going to a main audio with the PowerPoint presentation. It is worth your time. It's amazing. We've had Richie on the podcast before. He's all talking about his research in the study of the language of both cider and wine. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Thanks for being here, Richie. I'm going to hand it over to you and step off screen here now so you can present this amazing presentation on tasting cider. Hi, uh, thanks, Raya. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, so this is slides which I presented at, at CiderCon um, concerning a, a proposal for a systematic approach to tasting cider. So if we move on to the, the next slide. Okay, so just to, um, to give an agenda, um, I'm going to introduce myself, give some of the background, and then um, the difficulties describing taste itself, language. Why is it so difficult? I'll then move into a proposed systematic approach to tasting cider. And finally, consider where does that fit within the overall language, the lexicon which we are using to describe cider. So if we move on to the next slide, it's let's let me introduce myself. Okay. So I'm Richie Brady. Um, how did I get here? What why was I speaking at CiderCon? So my background is in initially wine, grapes. I got the WSET, um, so the Wine and Spirits Education Trust Diploma, level four. And from that qualification, professional qualification, I then became a, a wine educator, so a CAVA educator. I'm an associate judge at the uh, International Wine Competition in London. And I, I also got into speaking. So you could see in the, the Dublin Gastronomic Symposium, I have a, I presented a paper of one. Is the language of wine broken? We'll touch on a little bit of that today. But again, the question, why am I here? So after looking at wine, I became interested in apples and cider. I did a master's in gastronomy and food studies. And my thesis was on adopting a systematic approach to tasting cider and the Irish cider, craft cider industry. So again, I've become He's got a, a, a contributor. So as, as Ria mentioned, I've, I've, I've spoken with her previously on, on Cider Chat. Um, you may be familiar with some of my thoughts if, if you had subscribed to the, the Malice magazine, the Cidercraft magazine. So I've, I've written to that as well. And I've also worked with the, the Irish Food Board, Board Bia, on trying to help and promote, discover Irish craft cider as well. So that's really my background. So what was my thesis about where did I come from? And I think the next slide will, will help to start positioning that. Um, so no surprise, I'm Irish, as you can probably tell from my accent. And the, the bottom right picture there is that the beautiful south west coast of Ireland. But in Ireland before the, nine, before the 17th century, the 1600s, Gaelic Ireland, the Brehon laws, the legal system which survived at that time, was a system of kings and chiefs, judges, poets, druids. I love the concept of a society being, being ruled by poets. Very interesting. But the laws of that time, the Brehon law, recognised and categorised trees and shrubs based on their economic value. The highest of those was the lords of the woods. And there were seven um, woods in there. Or trees in there, so oak, ash, holly, hazel, yew, Scots pine, and the apple tree, the wild apple tree. So if you damaged those trees, you were fined the equivalent of two cows which were providing milk and a three-year-old cow. So that, that, that hefty 
fines. You also have to uh, provide compensation for the damage you had done, which was a one-year-old cow for, for merely cutting off the branch of an apple tree. So we know that apple trees were protected in Gaelic Ireland. But what about cider? So on the next slide. So in Gaelic Ireland, songs, poetry, were used to emphasize things. Documentation wasn't really used and cider is not emphasized in the songs or the poetry. Very, very limited documentation. In fact, it was a document, O'Daverin's glossary from the 17th century, the lovely script you can see there, the Gaelic, the old Gaelic script. And there's a word in there, nen admin, which in 1873, one of the authors, Eugene O'Curry, said, the ancient Irish also made a kind of cider called Nen Admin from wild or crab apples, which is greatly prized. Subsequently, you can see writers in 1999 weren't so positive. They said it's a possibility. So we have doubts in Gaelic Ireland as to the presence and position of cider. We know apple trees were revered, but cider, we're unsure. So on the next slide, let's move up in time a little bit. So after Gaelic Ireland, when English rule was in place, and during that English rule in a particular period, in, when the George I, George II, etc., those various kings were ruling, it's called Georgian Ireland, I came across documentation from, if you can see on the, the right-hand side of the screen, there, 1737. And cider is obviously present, but it's also regarded. And everyone in CiderCon knows the economic importance of cider. It's a business. And in 1737, they're saying cider is a business of some importance since the consumption of that agreeable liquor is considerably increased and every day increasing. It was a considerable article of our importations. So that group, that Dublin Society, are really saying, why are we importing this? Why are we not producing it ourselves? Interestingly, just if you can see in the right hand side there, cider is spelled C-Y-D-E-R. That's 1737. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see but by 1740, they have a collection of, of observations. And in the second column, on that page, you might see that they spell cider with an S, S-Y-D-E-R. But the key point here is that, that that group, that Dublin Society, which is a group of wealthy gentlemen, they write about using cider to strengthen Ireland economically. So they hope of introducing wealth among us against the constant drain of large and numerous importations. They say that they're unlimited dependency on imports. So they're laboring at their looms for the benefit of others. Why? They looked at the soil and went, or the natural land went, the natural soil of this island would, under proper management, make it as remarkable for wealth as it is now for poverty. And obviously at that time, they're referring to it as a barren desert, destitute of everything, but some straggling herds of cattle since, at a moderate consumption, half the wealthy yearly is drained out of this kingdom. So then if we move to the next slide. So what were those instructions? And I've spoken um, with Rhea and Cider Chat about those instructions, some of those detailed instructions, and they were about hand harvesting. So this is 1737, hand harvesting apples from the tree rather than off the ground with windfalls discarding damaged apples, having triage tables, delicate handling, how to crush, you know, pressing which juices they'd use. They preferred the first run juice, etc. And lots of instructions on the treatment preparation of barrels. They regarded cider as equal to wine. So in its highest degree of perfection, this cider is not inferior to the juice of grapes, 
and seems to be bestowed by nature as a full equivalent. And to obtain this should be the aim of all those who deal in cider. So they established the economic importance, where it was, and trying to trying to give instructions on how to make it. Okay, so on the next slide, we're saying, but how did they describe it? And they recognized themselves of going, the difficulty in describing the taste of cider. Tis a hard matter to describe to the palate and set the rules to taste. The endless variety of different flavors to be found in different kinds of cider. They also put in the phrase, reckoned an advantage. They recognize that the complexity of the different flavors from the multiple varieties was an advantage which was being underutilized. They just didn't know how to describe it. And I think we have many of the same challenges today. And that's where my research brought me and began me to, to, to look at this area. Thank you so much, Richie. We're going to be rolling next to the main audio here and stepping off screen. So that's the segue into the difficulties in describing taste and language. So well-known um, wine consultant, Emile Peignard, referred to working against the barrier of the inexpressible. We need to be able to describe the indescribable. We tasters feel to some extent betrayed by language. So why is that? And particularly in English, why is that? Firstly, in English, smell descriptors are overwhelmingly source descriptors. So the smell of a lemon, the smell of roses. In English, the, major the vast majority of our words come from a source, something physical which you can hold. But you're trying to describe the intangible, which is a smell. So the summary really is, your choice of words for what you have tasted does not mean that the person you're speaking to is going to share that understanding. You may feel that you fully know what you're saying, but the listener has a completely different interpretation. Subjective, your view, objective, what the other person will hear. And Jancis Robinson, who is, let's say, the, the, the wine world's top authority, in the Oxford Companion to Wine, wine descriptors are in their linguistic infancy, parallel to the days when linguistic sound could only be described by comparison to other sounds. This is not easy. We all refer to tastes and descriptions, etc., but this is difficult and it's recognized as such. So I'm just going to step through a little bit. But in the wine world, where is the language of wine at the moment? Where did it come from? And what, dare I say, pitfalls? All right there. So in the early 20th century, wine descriptions are very much a gentleman's club, the old English gentleman's club. And as you can see by the image, outsiders not welcome. It's by invitation only. So this was people who were writing about wine for whom drinking fine wine, the best of wines, was part of their everyday life. So it's exclusive and restricted to the industry insiders. It's a trade establishment. Interestingly, when they described wine, they didn't describe the flavors. They described wine as a whole, the holistically. What they were interested in was going, the typicity of it. Is this typical for a Bordeaux? Left bank, right bank. They were considering long-term investments. What am I going to lay down in my cellar if you're lucky enough to have one? They're not talking about acidity. They're not talking about tannin or sweetness. There's no detailed flavors or aromas. You are meant to already know what they're talking about. So how can you crack into that world? How can you understand what they're saying? So George Sainsbury, in his Notes in a Cellar book in 1920, and I, I, I am trying to draw out bits here, which I think is like, wow, you could not say that today. So he talks about a particular wine and gun. It has not the feminine grace and charm of claret, the transcendental qualities of Burgundy and Madeira. There is something about it which has been created in the pre-established harmony with the best English character. So again, the Oxford Companion to Wine does refer to him, and 
This is a quote as a crusty old author. So what does he mean by feminine? What does he mean by transcendental? A pre-established harmony of national character. So within this realm again, you already have to be on the inside. You have to share the understanding which they have. And Michael Broadbent, in the great vintage book, 1980, famous quote goes, style and quality and condition are of more value than precise descriptions of the actual smell or taste. Pinot smells like Pinot. How do I know if I'm coming to wine for the first time what a Pinot smells like? And Andre Simon, and did this, this I like again. A 1926 Chablis reminded him of the grace of the silver willow, of the stateliness of the Italian poplar, of the magnificence of the purple beech, and the majesty, majesty of the royal oak. Seriously. What do different types of trees taste like? What are the flavors that graced stateliness, magnificence, and majesty of a tree? And not even of a tree, what do those items taste of? But going back to it, and what does Pinot smell like in the first place, if you have never smelt it before? So the door is closed here. 1970s, we move on. And obviously Robert Parker, who I presume many of you will know of it. Robert Parker in The Wine Advocate brings in, folks, the informal, entertaining, supposedly a 100-point system. Realistically, it's from 70 points onwards. Um, but he's lots of aromas and flavors descriptions. He's also very entertaining. He refers to one wine as hazardous to your health if drunk, a stinky, rotten wine. And as opposed to the finesse of the royal oak, we now have the finesse of a horny hippopotamus. Again, I had no comment. I just put in a question mark on that. I don't think there was anything appropriate for me to actually state. However, the industrial impact of Parker and his preference for what he liked and the following which he gained influenced the wine industry. So out of that, there came a lot of alcoholic, fruit-laden bombs, so fruit bombs laden with vanilla and oaky flavors. So ripe, high alcohol, lots of oak on them. And as uh, Alice Ferry refers to it as the Parkerization. However, people who made those wines and followed them through and decided this is the path we're going down, there's lots of commercial success. In 1984, the wine aroma wheel, on the left-hand side there, so it's concentric circles of increasing precision of aromas. So first of all, fruity, then it's citrus, and then on the outer circle, grapefruit and lemon. This has been widely adopted and imitated. You see this in coffee aroma wheels, chocolate aroma wheels. But this is the first place where it came, and subsequently people obviously picked it up. There's concerns about exaggerated descriptions. If I get grapefruit, I'm going to say lemon. Also a suggestion. I'm convincing myself if I get cherry, I also have apricot peach. And realistically, bluff. People are just, at times, to pick tropical fruit and they would name every one of those which they saw. And the quote comes out at the end is, it be has become, some people refer to it as, a recipe for a fruit salad. I'm going to say citrus, I'm going to name about three of them. I'm going to say tropical fruit, I'm going to name about four. Suddenly you have six descriptors down there. And just to say, let's not forget cider itself. I should have the year for this, I don't, I think it's about 1970. A.A. Williams in the Long Ashton Research Station was trying to, looking at the development of a meaningful language is essential for cider. Because ciders are very complex, but extremely varied in aroma character. So he was looking for terms, what can we use, which are universally understandable and accurately defined, particularly in terms of readily accessible standards. There's lots of cider wheels out there as well, and in no way do I take away from them. I actually support them. It's great. I just wanted to recognize where A.A. Williams was coming from. Interestingly, on the left-hand side, it's very much an odor class. Interestingly, on the right-hand side then, he is getting into the chemicals, the esters, which may be there, etc. And he's interested in that part of it. So it is, it is complex. In the 1980s, Burden McNeese came out, while they were studying for the Masters of Wine, with their own tools, they came out with quantitative measurements. So 
So this is a systematic approach which they came out with, which was adopted subsequently by the Wine and Spirits Education Trust in the wine world and for spirits. So what do we mean by systematic? It's structured and repeatable. It's the same way every time, the same questions, think of it. That gives you consistency, gives you confidence. But to this day, to this time, everybody has been talking about the stateliness of various trees, or talking in insider language. And when Bird and McNeese came along, they began to talk about measurements. If I pick one there and I go acidity, low, medium minus, medium, medium plus, high. Nowhere else were people talking about that until they came. So we now see the introduction of a systematic approach, which is quantitative. What's the weight of low acidity? We'll talk about that later on. What is high? So as mentioned there, yep, the W, the Wine and Spirits Education Trust and the Court of Master Sommeliers subsequently adopted this approach. So systematic. A little bit of way then from the quantitative is metaphors, and I will always pronounce these people's names incorrectly, so my apologies. So, Caballero and Suarez Toste. They wrote a paper where they were looking at all the wine writings and going, what metaphors are used? So I've just tried to condense them into a table. Wine is a living organism, so you'll see words being used which are health related. So somebody would talk about the vigor or for wine, which they didn't like, they're referring to sickly, malnu malnourished, weak, and tired. Family relationship, where they're talking about a wine from the same winery, different years. They may talk about a sister, a peer, sibling, etc. Some flags should be going up here. I get very nervous in this area. Because they then, they highlighted anatomical metaphors, personality. Excuse me for, for calling these out, but these have to be flagged. We're going big-bodied, fleshy, sinewy, long-limbed. We're not going to be using those today. Where did they, how they got away with it? It's a separate conversation. I'm just going to move on. It's there on the slide to be read. But then also, so if we have wine, and think of cider now yourselves, as a living organism, what about textiles? So the fabric, what's the mouthfeel? So people began to go... Um, referring to it as interwoven and the fabric, it feels, how does it feel velvety, smooth on the palate? And again, a monster in a beautiful frock. I don't see us using those metaphors anymore, but just to call them out from where they're coming from. And then structure, what I, what I see is wine or cider as a building. So people talk about the edges, the layers. Is it square? Is it angular? Pointed and round. And then most recent, to sort of wrap up of where the trends have been going, Natty speak. And Emily Timberlake highlighted this in 2020. And it's the emergence of a, of a new a lexicon, new language, particularly around the natural wine movement. And this is all about intuition and subjective experience, rather than objective, analytical weights, measurements. This is, how do I feel? So the quote being, it's intentionally rudimentary, filled with fuzzy and friendly seeming words, quite conceptual. So some of the, the, the words highlighted would be glug glug, gluggable, smashable, downable, for chugging, easy juice, funky bretty, I don't think so. I think, I think bretty is, we know where it comes from. So I probably disagree with that word being there. I think that's a little tough. But again, that is all about subjective. How do I feel? Membership through language. The words we use to talk about wine often say more about which club we want to be part of. So she refers to nerd or jock, country or rock and roll. How do you define yourself? What club are you part of? What do you want to be part of the language you use? Michael Silverstein refers to it as semantic registries. So if you use terms in a certain way, you're part of a club. Other members of that club recognize that you're using those words, that language the in crew, whatever way you want to refer to it. Again, post-2000 trends is feelings and imagination. So Andrew Jaffrey, very famous wine writer. Analytics leave no role for imagination. And tasters should not be a policeman so much as a psychoanalyst or a confessor. Allow people to say what they want. Do not judge. And again, Hannah Howard, 
exploring attributes beyond flavor, like how a wine makes you feel. So this is a step just beginning to go beyond flavor itself. The one which I love, which is quite hard to describe or get one's head around, is John Dilworth. He refers to somebody describing a wine as imaginative improvisation. I'm going to say improvisation just because I can't pronounce it. But imaginative improvisation theater. We're describing the taste as a sensory theme. So you're on the stage and you're improvising. However, that's the language of wine. So professional wine writer symposium in 2021, Esther Mulby, highlighted claims the widespread agreement that the language used to talk about wine is broken. She's supported by Jancis Robinson on that as well, in some of her comments as well. Eurocentric, absolutely. Colonialism, racism, sexism, and being exclusionary. I'm not going to step into those, but yes, that's where the language of wine has got to, so it, it is changing and moving. So proposed systematic approach to tasting cider. So this is aligned and very similar. Can I use the word inspired by? Both the WSCT's systematic approach to tasting wine and the American Cider Association's Pommelier Sensory Analysis Worksheet. It applies to not just cider, but perry, pomo, etc. The key pieces here is structure and then the flavors and aromas. Yes, it is analytical. And there's a detailed version and a less detailed version. Key piece is you approach the glass without knowing what's inside it. So that's a bad phrasing, isn't it? You approach the glass with cider, you're in it, but you don't know who made the cider, how it was made. You know nothing about it. So there's no prejudice. You don't know the production method to the technical details. You're focused only on the liquid in the glass. Key thing, same question, same order every time. So here's the structure. So appearance, aromas, and then the palate. So the appearance, clarity, intensity, color, and then other. So is it still petulant? Is it sparkly? The colors from straw all the way through to tawny. And I'm not gonna pick out each of these because I know people won't be able to see them and it can be a little bit uh, tough to follow. The aromas, what's the intensity? Is it light, medium, or pronounced? I have my own, in my own mind, my own cheats for these. So in the glass, if you swirl the glass and it's three, four inches from your nose, can you smell it there? Or do you have to poke your nose into the glass to get the aroma? If it's jumping out at you, it's pronounced. If you are struggling putting your nose in the glass, it is light. On the aroma, the characteristics is actually the next slide. It's the aromas and flavors. Okay, a little bit of differences here. You could see the perceived sweetness level. And there's a couple of points here. You will see the word perceived all the way through this in a couple of places. Lots of you are cider makers. You're all cider enthusiasts. I presume you all have an interest when making your ciders of going, I want to know what the residual sugar, sugar is, grams per liter. So when you then go to taste your own cider, you know this has two grams of sugar residual left in it. But that means you already come to the glass with a prejudice as to what it is going to taste like. You should know nothing about the cider as you go to taste it. Acidity, the same thing. It's perceived acidity, perceived, sorry, perceived sweetness, perceived acidity, and perceived tannin. It's not the actuals. It's what are the physical reactions in your mouth. So let's get physical reactions going. So for sweetness, the, and I fully recognize sweetness, is tasted all across the mouth, but particularly this concentration at the tip of the tongue. I always think of it like, a, dare I say, like a snake, where the, the forked tongue at the end, that bit in between is where I certainly perceive sugar. And so if I was to get a shot glass of water and then fill it with as much sugar as I could and then dip my tongue into it, I get a physical reaction. I'm not saying to actually drink the glass of sugared water, but it's just to familiarize yourself with where the sweetness physically kick off, what do you actually feel? The tip of your tongue, that little spot, do you get a physical reaction? Acidity, again, this is perceived acidity. Physical reaction, what is the best way to describe this? If you taste your cider, swirl it around your mouth, what I would suggest is then open your mouth and turn your head downwards. And if you want to know what acidity is, it's really about uh, saliva. And I'll use the wrong phrases, but I think of it as running down the sides of the cheeks you know, the inside of your mouth, it's... But if you open your mouth 
and face downwards. The key question will be, how soon do you think you're going to have to swallow? Or how soon do you think you're going to be dripping on the table? So it's a physical reaction. It has nothing to do, well, it, obviously it has to do with the grams per liter of tartaric acid, etc., etc. but you're looking for physical reactions. If you're swallowing every five seconds for 20, 30 seconds, it's high acidity. Whereas if you swallow once, that's it. It's low acidity. So if you think of five seconds, then 10, then 15, then 20, what, how often are you swallowing? So as to, if you have your head pointed down, so as to avoid dripping on the, on the table. And then tannin is the same thing. Okay, so tannin is, you know, gums, etc. but different types of apples will have tannins in different parts of the mouth. So Kingston Black last night, I found my interpretation, the tannins are on the front roof of the mouth, the front of the palate, as opposed to somewhere else, like different wines will have tannins in different places. The alcohol level at the back of your mouth, do you get a burn after you swallow? It's a physical reaction, it doesn't have to be a burn, it's a, is there a sensation there? So we're talking about sweetness, acidity, and tannin. A balance between those with alcohol. Again, all of these are physical reactions. I haven't talked about a flavor or aroma yet. And the flavor intensity, light, medium minus, medium, medium plus, pronounced. There's a couple of observations here. We could say at this stage, and you've tasted, you're tasting the wine, minerality, chalk, slate, steely, mineral, or is it oily, cloying? Somebody would be a fair question to go, Richie, why didn't you put that? Why are those observations here and not on the flavors and aromas? Because we've tasted it. I think that's a fair question. I, I will bypass the answer to that because I felt it just fitted better here. I'm going to talk about the um, level of complexity as well. How many different flavors are you getting? What groups, what flavor groups do they sit into? Is it all citrus? Is it all apple? Or is there a selection of stone fruit, tropical fruit? Is there some oak on it? Are you getting that? Are there leaves? Is there mallow? As you describe more of those, the complexity level goes up. And just the last one is the finish. So if you taste a cider, once you swallow, is the taste gone within five seconds? Or is it there for 20 seconds? Short, medium, or long? So again, five seconds, let's call it short. 20, let's call it long. But all of this is before we get to the flavors and the aromas. The vast majority of things here is about what are the physical reactions in your mouth. In the acidity, it's very uh, weights and measurements, isn't it? Low, medium, high. What's the nature of the acidity, sir? Is it dull or is it vibrant? So dull, sour, crisp, bright, vibrant, racing, vinegary, not a, not a real positive word there. But vibrant, bright, racing, yes. These are positive words. So when you're describing your ciders, you don't need to say, it's medium, medium plus. You could choose a different word which describes the nature of it. So racing acidity, I expect to be swallowing every five seconds because this is refreshing my palate. The saliva is, is running down the sides of my mouth. And then in tannin, is it soft or is it drying? And I'll wave a little flag here going, I recognize sweetness and the American Cider Association, I think agreed two years ago, words to use around, is it dry, semi-dry, semi-sweet or sweet? If we go over to the tannin, I'm just flagging the word drying, the active verb. It is not related to sweetness, so people may go, it's a dry wine, how can it be drying as well? Drying refers to the tannin. So again, it's soft, astringent, sort of like black tea. Don't put any milk in your tea, drink black tea, you'll know what the tannins are about. Is it puckering? So again, needing to refresh your mouth and hoping that there's some acidity in that cider to balance out the puckering as well. On the extreme, it can be bitter and coarse. So onto the flavors and the aromas, just sort of two sections here. Primary fruit. What are the flavors you are getting? And this is, let's just call this out now. This is about the flavors which you taste. It is not saying something which went into the make the cider. It is not referring to a co-ferment or an addition afterwards. You are approaching the glass without knowing what's in it, how it was made. So you should be asking yourself, the questions are going, okay, I've done the structure. Now for the flavors, am I getting primary fruit? Hopefully you are. Am I getting green fruit or am I getting citrus? 
stone fruit or tropical fruit. And within those, let's call them groupings, so the primary fruit, I'm not trying to say you must use these words. These are only suggestions. And the first one here is going to be, again, a little bit of a flag. I'm Irish. Gooseberries are something which are available to us. However, they're not fully available to everybody globally. They are basically unknown in China. And I understand here in the States, they're accessible to some people in some places. So it's why use that word? So to recognize, these are just suggestions. So again, gooseberry, apples, so green, red, etc. Pear, quince, the citrus fruit. And I, I'm conscious of not draining all of these. But the citrus fruit is the stone fruit, so peach, apricot, nectar, etc. Red fruit, strawberry, raspberry, red cherry. Other primary crops, herbaceous flavors, so green pe pepper, capsicum, grass, hay, asparagus, herbal, so mint, medicinal, eucalyptus, etc. Dill, fennel, floral. Are you asking yourself these questions when you approach the cider going, okay, I'm gonna check for, am I getting green fruit? If so, which of those am I getting? Am I getting something herbaceous? If so, what do I think? What words do I want to use to describe that? Herbal, same idea. I put hops there, recognizing that people add hops in their cider making. The right hand side, it's the second half of the page, it's secondary, so it's not primary fruit or primary cops, but it's something which comes out from the and the secondary activity, so fermentation related. So tannins, and black tea, earthy, smoky bacon, farmyard. I would interpret these as being coming from the fermentation itself of the apples. You can see put together bread, toast, dough, biscuit. So we're thinking sort of yeast here. Butter, cream, cheese, yogurt. Thinking of malolactic. Barrel related, so what type of wood? What was in, if it's a barrel, what was in there previously? If it's oak, vanilla, cloves, American oak, coconut. That's what we are thinking. So again, dried fruit. Um, I don't want to drain this. But again, nuts and aging, I think, is, is just worth if you are aging your ciders. What should you expect? What do you think will suddenly appear in an aged cider? So almonds, hazelnut, walnut, coffee, chocolate. Before moving on, I just love that word, uh, the other there. I think it's a word we should bring back. Petrichor, you know that smell after a long dry spell when it rains? Some of these flavors are associated with production techniques. So tropical fruit, it could be potentially flavored. Red fruit, the same thing. It could be fruit additions, cranberry could be added. Flavor is associated with lees, autolysis, malolactic, wooden barrels, etc. Each of those sort of paired. And just at the end is actually trying to give a conclusion. Is the cider balanced or not? What do we mean by that? So is the acidity balanced with the tannin? Is there a flavor there or is it all just tannin and acidity with no fruit flavors? Is the alcohol out of step? Is the alcohol burning? And the other sort of factors which one would consider is the length. If a beautiful cider disappears and the flavor disappears from your mouth within five seconds, it's got a short length. Whereas if it continues for 20 seconds, it's great. So it's the length, the intensity, and the complexity. And then, again, controversial, opinion of quality. It's not, that is an opinion, it's a suggestion. It's not saying whether the cider is or is not good, very good, outstanding. But it's about going through the process to go, is it balanced? What was the length like? What was the intensity? I got loads of different flavor groups. And is it complex? Appearance, aroma, structure. Again, putting in the intensity, the sweetness, acidity, etc. And on the flavors, trying to avoid that fruit salad type of description. But it's again, is it fruity? Is it citrus or stone fruit? It's literally just taking the words of those groupings and putting them here. And again, that leaves it very much open for people to use their own suggestions of going, I have a citrus fruit, but here's what I'm familiar with. Or here for your audience, to whom you're trying to sell. This is what they are familiar with, because that's what it's all about. So an example of a, of a, of a sweet kieved would be lightly sparkling, sweet, and vibrant. So again, the acidity there. Don't need to say high acidity, vibrant. Pronounced flavors of stone fruit and tropical fruit. Fragrant flowers, sweet vanilla and caramel. Long and complex finish. I'm conscious of time, and I'm just going to pose a Let's say a consideration of where does it fit potentially with insider's lexicon. 
So a suggestion of combined overall cider lexicon. On the left-hand side, what is cider? What's the taxonomy of cider? What do we mean by cider? Is it co-ferment, additions afterwards? Is it 100%? All of that conversation. The piece which I would say is going, well, have a systematic approach to tasting cider. What words are going to be used? What components will be analyzed? And how are you going to analyze them? Low, medium, high, etc. And when you come out, if you write that down, you come out with a profile of the taste and structure of the cider. Now, there are other words in the lexicon to be agreed. So production methods, words relating to varieties, growing practices, harvest practices, in the orchard. And in the cidery itself, there's lots of words which the general public will not be aware of, and you guys are trying to sell to the general public. So dotted lines around here, sort of indicating to be completed, to be defined. And then in geography, again, orchard related and cider related. Let's not forget geography. If I've approached, let's say there's 20 ciders in the table, I approach each one without knowing how it was made. I go through that systematic tasting approach. I ask the same question, same way, every time. Note down the results. What you have is a profile of the cider. What happens if you 15 of those ciders are extremely similar? You're most likely to sort of group them together and go, there's a commonality here. Do you, do you group them together? And if you're grouping them together, how do you refer to that group? Now, what eventually happens is you go further right and you're going, if you're not a member of this taste profile, you can't be in this group, so you're limiting. And then suddenly on the right-hand side, you've gone from limiting to restricting, and there's rules, and there's, it looks very much like the wine world at that stage of going, what can I declare? So this is where my mindset came from initially. And then I got a bit of feedback on it. Why are we restricting? What are we doing here? This is not the way to go for cider. We want to bring people to cider, not exclude them with rules and regulations and words which can be used. However, what is still there is the systematic approach to tasting cider because it is a tool to try and help you taste your cider to define it. And then let's widen it and include it and take a little bit of the learnings or what's going on in the wine world. There's a big but here and the but is with warnings. And that is all to do with metaphors. And this is the wine world have fallen into this trap. If you refer to a living person, you are suddenly stereotyping. And that is not a path which we want to go down. However, to refer to textiles or to refer to buildings, you can mix all of those together. And all of this, so the analytical systematic approach to tasting, production methods, the words we use, geography. I've added in history here. But if you add those two, metaphors, or subjective experiences, because the language is moving on, it's changing, it's growing. And then I had to put in the imaginative. I love that concept of the, uh, the theater, standing on the stage, the imaginative improv. Sort of like when somebody says to you, oh, that cider reminds me of my holiday inn. And they're off telling you a story of their holiday. When all the, I don't know what the cider tastes like, but I know where you went on holidays. So all of that joins together. So this concept is for a systematic approach to fit within that. It is not meant to be restrictive. It is meant to help, to assist. I showed the photo here. He is not selling cider, and he is not selling wine. But what he is doing is storytelling. And the other three guys are listening to him. So it's all about the story. The systematic approach is focus on the liquid in the, ga in the glass without an expectation of how it was made. What's the style? What should I expect? The variation or the association of how it was made. Consistency. It's the same questions every time. Look at the structure and then look at the aromas and flavors. Focus on the consumer, the customer. Perceived sweetness and acidity. It is not, as a cider maker, going, I know what the residual sugar is, grams per liter. I know what the tannin is. That doesn't matter to the person who's drinking your cider. What do they taste? What's their perception? What are they getting? And then use appropriate flavor descriptors. I provided some suggestions. Use the words and the associations of flavors for your audience. So if they're familiar with different types of foods or fruit, then use those. Let us not be restrictive. 
I have my email is there, my Twitter is there. If you want to mail me, I'll pop on the actual documents to you. Thanks to Richie Brady for his talk on a systematic approach to tasting cider. Do subscribe to the Cider Chat YouTube channel so you never miss another Cider Chat. See you in Ciderville. This is Rhea Wincoller signing off for now.